You're listening to the Home Staging Show podcast. I'm your host, Cindy Lin. This is a show where we talk about all things real estate, home staging, and selling your home to live and to sell. Welcome back to season seven. This is episode seven. Our show is brought to you by the Staging Assistant. It's more than an inventory system. Manage your leads, your proposals, your clients, and your stage houses on your desktop, tablet, or phone. With a staging assistant, you will know what you own, where it is, and when it's returning quickly and easily. Create your design and packing list from the comfort of your home, so you can hit the ground running when you go into your warehouse. Created by stagers specifically for stagers, is the only tool you need to manage your growing staging business. For more information, visit stagingassistant.com. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Home Staging Show. So on today's show, I'm interviewing Mary Pope Handy, who has been selling real estate full time since 1993. She's based in Los Gatos and sells real estate throughout San Jose, Saratoga, Campbell, and over Santa Clara County in California. She's been a top five percent producer since the early years. Have won many awards for production, but also for services and her real estate writing. She's a prolific blogger and also a real estate educator, and that is why I thought it would be amazing to have Mary on the show today. So on today's show, we talk about the best practices in selling a home, as well as habits of a successful real estate professional. We also dive into blogging for real estate and how to blog successfully for your real estate business. So I have just quick little announcement before we go into the show today. Next week, the podcast will be taking a one-week break. I've been dealing with some personal health issues. I had an old back injury that's now extended to my neck and also my hip on the right side, and it's been difficult for me to move around and do work or spend long time on my feet, which I frequently do um, nowadays uh, in my work. So I was not able to record an episode with a guest this week, but the week after, I'll be interviewing Pam Christensen again. So she was really amazing early this season with her expertise in workflow management, home staging logistics, and also inventory management. And her episode has gotten a lot of great feedback. She's going to come back to talk to us about profit margin this time. I'll be announcing the recording time in our private Facebook group and also through our email list. So if you're not yet on our email list, you can just go to stagemore.com and sign up. Um, so thank you so much, Mary, for joining us today on the show.、Um, tell us a little bit about how you got started in real estate. Well, I started in real estate, and I just hit my 25-year.、Um, Anniversary of beginning. I started in early 1993, and I had decided to change careers. I had, I used to be a school teacher, and I have a bachelor's and master's in theology, and I taught religion in Catholic high schools, which I loved. Then we had two kids. I stayed home for four years, and even then, Silicon Valley was an expensive place to live. And looking at the cost of childcare and education, I made a decision to follow my mother into real estate. Rather than to go back to the classroom, and it wasn't that I didn't love what I did before, but just the practical realities of living here、um, really nudged me in the direction of trying to make more money as a better living for my family. So I just started for practical reasons. I I really love it, but it's changed a lot over the years. I bet. What are some of the biggest changes you think? Oh gosh.、Um, well, the MLS didn't used to have photos. I mean, maybe we had one. When I started,、it、used to be all in a binder, right? It's like this huge、right. book you've lugged well, around. That was before me,、uh, but my, when I was growing up, my sister and I used to make money by getting my mother's updates and swapping out the sold homes for the new listings in her binder every two weeks or something. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and then we had thermal paper on the MLS, which was really exciting that you could be at home and get the MLS. That was just so. Wonderful, but you know, being thermal paper, if you left it in your car in the sunshine, it was toast. So, I mean, those kind of changes have happened. I, the biggest ones has has to be where the data is available. I mean, we had trouble getting the data except in certain locations, and now anybody walking down the street can get data on their cell phone. So it's really revolutionary. That's really amazing.、Um, so, yeah, I mean, technology has come. So far in real estate, now anyone, buyers and sellers, they can find out information about 
homes on the internet. And I mean, I think when I got started in real estate, it was 2013. That was 2016. No, sorry, 2014. And so that was that was MLS. Everything was online, but、mm-hmm. that was I think when Zillow just started, or Trulia just started. I couldn't tell you. I don't remember when different players came in, but but、um, yeah, they've been both around for at least five years, I think. Yeah, but the thing is that now it's changed so much, where consumers have so much information and they have so much power in a way. To be able to access anything that they want, almost anything that they want about the market today, or competitive,、um, competing listings in their neighborhood. That's true. Although some of the information isn't right, like the county records on the home size is often incorrect. Especially if somebody's added on, even with permits and finals, it might not be reflected in the county records. And some of these auto valuation sites. Aren't very good at it, and I don't want to pick on any one in particular, but most of them are off by fifteen, twenty percent. I'm getting a new website made right now, and they proudly boasted about their auto comp valuation, and I was horrified. On my own personal house, it was fifteen percent too low, and I'm conservative, so I don't kind of carry around an inflated view of my own home. So there, there's also a lot of misinformation. Are they do? You know what's happening in this zip code, but that zip code might have three different school districts, and they might be behaving very differently within the zip code. So I think there's still a place for realtors to provide real value by helping to clear some of that smoke and to make the information available to consumers that's relevant rather than stuff that's extraneous. I think that's a really good point. I'm glad that you brought up that because I think most consumers, most Sellers, they probably don't realize that the home evaluation can be quite off, and so when they're having that conversation with a the realtor, they might be shocked as to what price comps that the realtors had brought in. So, have you encountered situations like that before? Yes, and you know, I'm online with a bunch of groups on Facebook and other places where realtors talk about some of their biggest challenges, and not so much in my market, but in other places in the country, some of these large Well-known、um, websites that do valuations might give an inflated idea to a consumer, and maybe Mr. and Mrs. Home Seller have got a house that they've kept immaculately clean, but it still looks like 1964. And what Zillow and Bank of America and Epraise and these other sites are doing often is a mix of original condition but well maintained. Mostly updated, completely remodeled, somewhat updated, and most homes have some updating but aren't fully updated. And so they think that every home is worth this number because Zillow said it, or because Bank of America or Appraisal or some other site said it. When in fact, if their home is in a completely original condition, it'll probably be worth less. Or if it's on a busy street, it'll be worth less, or something like that. And if it's completely remodeled or even rebuilt, of course, it's going to be worth more. So people put too much credence in a number produced by an algorithm, whereas if you kind of study all the houses that are most similar to yours, you might be able to say, well, look, this one has hardwood floors, and so does mine, and then kind of, you know, drill it down to where it's more ac- accurate, more appropriate. I agree with that because ultimately, every house is a little bit different. I mean, even if you know, let's track homes where. The house to house, the floor plan is very similar, but depending on the conditions of the home, also what improvement the homeowners have done, I mean, it's going to make differences in the numbers, and that's something that algorithm can't really know. Well, right. I mean, those sites have not been inside to know that this one house maybe smells like beeswax because somebody was had a candle making hobby, and some other house smells like incense, and some other house smells like, you know, a, a particular kind of food. And you're never going to know that unless you visit the house and go inside. And even appraisals,、um, people think, well, it was appraised for this amount, so that's how much it should sell for. But appraisals are backwards looking in time. And what real estate agents try to do is project what will the home be worth to the most likely buyer a month from now when it goes on the market. So we try to look forward at what's what's the trajectory. And we know that if you have a, you know. A turpentine smell or an orange-colored sink in your kitchen is not going to help. 
But if your appraiser doesn't have a sense of smell and thinks, you know, an orange kitchen is fine because it's functional, that's, you know, that's going to be a difference because maybe structurally it's fine, but marketability is going to be different. I think that is so true. And I think that is a really great point of that. And especially I'm glad you brought inspection because Inspection is huge, and I think most people don't realize that as well. Inspection can actually make and break a sale. Yes, uh, that's one of the few things you've, in our area, in my Silicon Valley area um, near San Jose, California, what's very normal is for sellers to provide a battery of pre-sale inspections, termite or pest, home or property, and if there's a house, then a roof inspection and a chimney inspection. If there's a pool, there's a pool inspection. And the reason they do that is because if everybody knows the condition up front, then buyers are more confident, they pay more, and they don't fall out of contract because three weeks in, they get an inspection that reveals a surprise that they didn't count on. And what I tell my sellers is, look, once your house sells, it's never going to sell for more than on the day that your contract is accepted. But if you don't have inspections, the price might go down a week or two later as buyers try to re- renegotiate. So um, Holiday Inn used to say the best surprise is no surprise. And that's really, really true. So of course, getting the home ready, you want to fix whatever's broken. If the light bulb is burned out, you wanna change it so the inspector doesn't have to call it out as possibly not working. There are all kinds of things to do. Um, to kind of maximize the price. But one of them is to make buyers confident. In fact, um, NAR, the National Association of Realtors, came out with some study not too long ago that indicated that when buyers are shown a problem or disclosed a problem, they tend to think it's going to cost five times what it actually does cost to fix. And I found that to be true. I had a listing not too long ago that needed to be re-roofed. So I told my clients, we will get a bid Bids don't cost anything, but it'll tell the buyer what does it cost. And we found out, you know, fifteen thousand dollars. And I asked some of my buyer clients, "What do you think it would cost to re-roof a small house?" And one of them said, "A hundred thousand dollars." So just taking away fear is so important uh, for a successful sale. Sorry, I kind of got long there on the uh, long window. No, mics, I but... love it. I mean, that is that's crazy though. I mean, five times that that is. That is astonishing for me. And it might not and be the same everywhere. that's also very scary. Yeah, I think most buyers, it's more like three times because they just don't know. And if it, they don't want to sign a blank contract, understandably, and sellers don't either, but just providing information makes buyers not feel like they're going to wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. What did I do buying this house when I don't know what I'm getting? It's terrifying. It is terrifying. I mean, it's so much money. It's, it's it is terrifying, especially the mortgage and everything that comes with it. Um, homeownership sometimes it's not for the faint-hearted because there's so much to do to deal with. Oh right. I mean, you ignore something and you think it's nothing, or you think, oh, I bought this house, but that maybe they suspect that the home inspector just overcalled it because they're f- afraid of lawsuits. But you ignore something like dry rot. It does not get better. It only gets worse. And you leave it long enough, dry rot in your bathroom floor. One of these days, somebody will walk in. They'll try to sit down on the toilet. And you and the toilet will go to the floor. They'll go to the ground. So you, it's really important to um, take those things seriously and not ignore them. But sometimes totally it's not agree. very gratifying if you're doing something like a foundation and uh, you're fixing your, your foundation or paying for drainage. It's just really not a very fun way to spend money. It's not, but it's necessary, unfortunately, because we don't want to fall through the earth when we're just, you know, chilling in our living room kind of thing. Yep, yep. And so I know you've also co-authored a book on home selling. So what are some of your top advices in selling the home? So I, I did that book in 2004. So some of my advice would change, but the basics are still the same. And that is get the pre-sale inspections. That's really, really important. Actually, the first, the most important thing is hire well. Hire a good agent to help you. It doesn't cost more to hire somebody who's experienced and knowledgeable and ethical than it does to hire somebody who just got their license and means well, but maybe doesn't know what they're doing. Um, And uh, so if you hire a good, honest, hardworking, successful agent, or even a new agent who's teamed up with a more senior agent for the guidance, right? Because everybody's new at one point. 
-hmm. But if you hire that person or that team, then they will help you to find good providers, good inspectors, good stagers, and all those things will reflect on your home and the way that it sells and will make a difference in whether it sells fast and how much it sells for. So that's the number one thing. And then as part of that, if you hire somebody good, they're going to have you do pre-sale inspections, at least in my area. That might not be true anywhere else in California. But they'll give you guidance on what you can do to maximize your sale price. So that might be cleaning, repainting, you know, usually taking care of surfaces that are just visually very big, like walls and floors and ceilings, the outside of the house, power wash it. So that so that people have a feeling this is a clean, well-loved home, as opposed to they just threw it on the market because they figure somebody will buy it. Uh, but a good agent will guide you through those things and will guide you through doing a careful job with the disclosures. And those are extremely important because if you don't disclose something, it may come back to bite you in a lawsuit. And the number one cause of lawsuits in real estate transactions are when buyers are not told the truth or the full truth by the sellers. Now, those requirements vary from state to state. And in some places, like I believe in Oregon, you only have to disclose things that are structural. Whereas in California, there's a bigger burden on the seller to disclose anything that would basically make a buyer decide not to buy the house or to pay less for it. And it doesn't have to be structural. So if you have a neighbor who's um, growing marijuana and selling it from the front porch, and there are communities where this is very active, then not every buyer may want to have that as a next door neighbor. So anyway, there's a lot of nuance to the disclosures that you'll want to make sure you get good guidance and your realtor should review your disclosures after you complete them to make sure that they are complete. Um, because again, any omissions might leave you kind of vulnerable to um, an adverse outcome, let's say. I think that's a really great advice. Um, I think most people don't realize how much liability it is involved in a real estate transaction, especially in California. Uh, Mary, do you know on top of your head how many disclosure we have in California? It's a stack. I just took a listing this morning and we did the, the easy disclosures, which aren't property specific. And there are like 12 pages of general disclosures for California, uh, from the California Association of Realtors form. And then there's lots of, you know, little regional things. Uh, you have to make statements about water heaters and lead paint. And th there's an awful lot. I have not counted the pages, but it's got to be between 50 and 75 pages. But the other thing is, and I love disclosures. I've taught classes on it before. The real burden is not to fill out the form, but is to disclose anything that would materially impact the value or desirability to a buyer. And so if the if the question's not on the form, but you know it will impact how they feel about the home, you may have an obligation to report it somewhere else. You may have to just freehand add, by the way, this is an issue, whatever it might be. You know, alligators come out at night and eat the snails in my front lawn. I mean, if you live in Florida, maybe that's an issue. I don't know. That's pretty crazy. I, I'm, Yeah, I mean, I think California disclosure is an animal of its own. Um, we, I think we're a unique state that does that because there are agents I met in Arizona they're like our our contract is five pages long and ah. I was like disclosure alone is longer than some states uh, sales contract basically but I oh, think that's much. yeah yeah, yeah. I think, but that's the vary. thing that's the thing that I think it's really important to hire well like you said like a really experienced real estate agent or a new agent with the guidance of a senior agent would be much more suitable for an important transaction. Right. And for everybody, whether it's, you know, whether you're in another state or, or here in crazy pricey California, it's always a huge amount of money, whatever it is. It's always, for most buyers, it's the most they can afford, which means it's a treasure. It's a huge amount of money. So you don't want to, you don't want to be overly casual about it because it's just too important. It is. But I'm curious, then how do new agents get started then? Well, when I started back in the dark ages, I actually did mentor under, uh, I was mentored by a an agent with four years of experience, which at the time I thought was, you know, just huge. But um, she was a successful agent and she was doing a lot of business. 
and she took me under her wing and I was able to get appointments for listings or for buyers. But, you know, I think people could smell that I was new. And so by teaming up, we were able to offer to especially potential listings, which are the hardest things to get. Um, the two for one, you know, you've got me with more time because I was a brand new agent. And then we've got the senior agent who's got more experience. And so it was not hard for me to find the time to go refill the flyer box or to run around and do whatever errands need to be doing, done. And I got valuable experience. So it was well worth it. I, I did three listings with her and learned a lot. In fact, she just retired from real estate not very long ago. I think that's great. I think there's so many nuances in real estate transactions. I think it's super beneficial to have a mentor or to be able to follow someone as an assistant, um, mm -hmm. whether it's real estate agent and even in the home staging field. Um, I get so many new stagers inquiry all the time. They just need a little bit of guidance sometimes to get started. Mm -hmm. And some companies have and, these hardcore training. So I, I don't want to say mentoring is the only way to do it. And some, you know, you might be okay with a new agent if they're in this training program where they're checking in with somebody every day or they're in a class every week and you know that everything's being looked after. So I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because there are really good programs that do not do mentoring. Yeah, I think the main thing is that like whoever you hire needs to know how to cross every T and then how to dot every I because there's so many details in a real estate transaction. I think most people underestimate how hard being a real estate agent is because that there are actually a lot that real estate agents have to put in to make sure the deal doesn't fall apart because the, the transaction can actually fall apart at every single, um, I guess, phase, like when you're moving through the different points of the transaction. Mm -hmm. I heard, uh, I think it was Tom Ferry, a real estate coach, say recently that 83% of the agents who get their license drop out within five years. I believe that. So it's a lot harder than it looks. People think that everybody makes 6% or 5% or whatever they think is the regular number uh, or the most common number, but it's usually half that. And then they split with their company and then they pay their expenses and then they pay uncle Sam. And so the amount that people take home is a lot less than what the public perceives. And the competition in my area is huge because where home prices are high, there are a lot of people with a license where home prices are low. Low, that's not true, but they have to do a lot of transactions to make a living. So in my area, a lot of stagers will put out their card or maybe even a little mini brochure about their staging for, you know, the broker tour or in case any other sellers might be interested. But the stager that I've um, been working with recently does a great job and she has so much business, she won't put out a brochure or anything. She doesn't need any more business, which is probably great. a great problem to have. Yeah. How did you get started blogging in real estate? Well, um, I like to write. And I, I was, in fact, I, growing up, I thought I was going to become a writer. I started college as an English major. And so in 2000 or 1999, I got a website. And in 2000, I started adding custom content to it. And I didn't know anybody else who was doing that. I just decided that the boilerplate website had information that wasn't really appropriate for my area. So Within about a year or two, I started getting business from the website, which was weird, but I was grateful. And so then I wrote this book because I like to write. And I thought, well, the website thing worked, so maybe the book will work. And it did. I did get some business from the book, but it was a lot more work. It didn't have the kind of staying power that blogs do. And so a few years after that, I started hearing about blogging. And so in about 2005 or six, I started dipping my toes in the water and didn't know what I was doing, and I did a very bad job. But then in 2007, um, I remember I was being coached by Joanne Fossland. Um, uh, Joanne.com is her URL, J-O-E-A-N-N. -N. She's a wonderful coach, wonderful human being. And I told her, I really want to learn how to do this blogging thing because it would be wonderful to make a living focusing on doing what I love as opposed to doing what I don't love. And one of her taglines is, life is too short to spend spend it perfecting your weaknesses. You know, so her thing is 
you should kind of delegate out the stuff you don't want to do, like hire a bookkeeper if you don't want to do your own tax, you know, record keeping and focus on what you love and let that expand. And I thought this resonates with me. So at the time I was flailing around, she was aware that Active Rain and Inman News were going to put on Project Blogger. And so she hooked me up with um, Francis Flynn Thorson, who is going to be a mentor for that contest. And I got thrown into the deep end of the pool to see if I could learn how to swim. So it was 14 weeks of a contest and Fran and I ended up winning, which was really fun. We got to designate our $5,000 winnings to the charity of our choice. And that was just so cool. But that's how I really learned how to blog. Um, and wanting to do it was just a matter of wanting to do what I like rather than cold call or door knock, which I tried in 1993, hated and swore I'd never do again. So that's kind of where that started. And Project Blogger was a lot of fun, although it was hard. And it wasn't that many months before I started getting leads and I could see that this was really going to be important to me. That is awesome. I actually remember Project Blogger. I think we met through Active We Rain. did meet there. I can't, I can't remember. It's been so long ago. Oh my God. No, I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure we met at the Inman News or the Inman Conference in San Francisco in the summer of 2007. I'm almost positive. We did, and that's more than 10 years ago, which is cra is really crazy to me. Yeah. Um, it, it seemed like yesterday. I actually really love that community at that time because I think Active Ring was fairly new, uh, and blogging for business was very new at the time. And so I, for, I just started my real estate business um, and then transitioned into become, become, uh, being a stager, and I just was really learning how to blog myself as well. And so... That community was really great because I was not only learning real estate, but also learning blogging and also making a lot of cool friends like you and mm -hmm. many other people I still talk to today. Me and too. Yeah, it, it just it was an absolutely amazing community. And then Active Ring just blew up. It had this huge thing, and they were like taking over or they're trying to sell them, whatever it Multiple was. Multiple times. Yeah, and so, but it was really nice to see people over the years and so much has changed I think for a lot of people and so it's, it's it's actually it's been a really nice journey and active rain is actually it's still plugging away real town is the platform I had used for the live in Los Gatos blog which is the one I was doing for project blogger and they they kind of um, they just didn't keep up they had an old platform and it eventually just went away entirely um, if you go the to real town now or real town blogs now you see some sign of we're coming back soon but um so i eventually had to transition over to wordpress but active rain is still there it's still big i think it's still a helpful community so it's if somebody's interested in blogging it's not a bad place to go and learn and read other people's blogs and get ideas so and it's it doesn't cost anything which is a good place to be when you're learning right and you're not even sure if you want to keep it up yeah, I pretty much learned how to blog on Active Rank, and then from mm -hmm. there I start learning about WordPress and reading about SEO and actually learning how to do basic coding because I think I think that's one of the tricky thing with WordPress because when we when we first started when I first started learning websites and blogging, there's nothing like you know Squarespace today where or a lot of other platform where it's just really easy drag and drop you don't have to learn any code and so mm -hmm. wordpress has that kind of a, a much steeper learning curve i would say you really need to know how to deal with plugins if they're not compatible backing up your site mm -hmm. so that brings me to a question i feel like they have to be very tech savvy to start a blog how do you feel about that well, I mean, there are all these different places. Blogger is still around too, which is a platform owned by Google. But I, I would say it's better to go once you're ready to be serious about blogging and you're done with kind of like your trial phase, don't want to spend any money. I think WordPress is actually not that scary. And there are a lot of companies that will host WordPress for you and back things up for you. Even GoDaddy has a managed WordPress um, a subscription, which is not too bad. I have a bunch of my things over there and they will automatically back stuff up for you every night. 
WordPress has gotten a lot more intuitive than it was 10 years ago when I felt like only an engineer could go there. It was just really intimidating to me. So I would say, you know, if somebody's not sure, start with something like Active Rain or Blogger and then but Active Rain above Blogger, I think, because it is real estate related. And then transition to something on WordPress, whether you self-host via GoDaddy or self-host via the Real Estate Tomato or, you know, Home Junction or some other company that will host it for you. And look around because they vary a lot in price and, and what they will do and not do. Some of them are a little bit restrictive. Um, but I would say WordPress is the way to go because you can do anything you can imagine. And you can always hire somebody to help you if you run into a problem. And I'm not afraid to do that. I think, you know, you don't want to spend 14 hours fixing a problem that would take an engineer or computer scientist 10 minutes to fix. It's just, you know, what's your time worth? Yeah, that's totally true. And so how much do you blog now and what do you blog about? So um, I didn't know when to quit. I started with Live in Las Gatas and then that worked so well. I thought, well, I'll try bigger. And so I took on basically the county. Instead of just the town of Las Gatas, I did San Jose, Las Gatas, Campbell, Saratoga, and then districts in San Jose that are nearby and on and on. And that also worked. And then I expanded it to relocation, which is moved to Silicon Valley. So anyway, I have like six blogs now because, like I said, I didn't know when to stop. And I, I, I'm not proud. That was a mistake. <laughs> I think it would have been smarter to have, you know, two or three or one really strong blog rather than six. But there are pluses to having a bunch. I can ping off of each other and all that. Um, uh, what I blog about is everything. Um, and sometimes I blog about events, but the people going to the events, like a music festival, are probably not interested in buying and selling homes. Right. So um, 80% of the leads online in real estate are buyers. So I would love it if I could shift it to make it 50-50 buyers, sellers, but that's just not going to happen. Um, and it's true for all the big sites as well. So I blog about things to attract my ideal client. And my ideal client is somebody in this price range, these locations, right? Because I don't want to attract a home buyer to Alaska. I don't sell there. So, um, so it's really important to think about what you want to attract and then kind of mentally fill out in your mind, who is this ideal type client? And it, the, what, the explanation I use is if you were going to talk about fire safety, you know, firefighting and, and flames and all that, you wouldn't have the same conversation with a kindergartner as you would with a man or woman who runs a nursing home versus a high school student. That You have different conversations for different audiences. And so whatever I write about is what I get. So at one point, I was blogging about Silicon Valley short sales. And before I knew it, I was number one on page one of Google for Silicon Valley short sales. And you know what? I hated short sales. Like, why did I do this to myself? Shoot me now. So um, I quickly realized that even though short sales were really big in 2009 and 10, that wasn't my target market. And so I stopped writing about it. So um, I write about neighborhoods. Um, so not just like Los Gatos, but the neighborhoods within Los Gatos. I started with historic districts because those are interesting and they're pretty. And I take pictures. I've had some videos. I do um, kind of an outline of what it costs to buy a home in these areas, how old are they, um, different things like that. So I'll do neighborhood profiles. I do market updates once a month. Um, and I, I have my daughter helping me. She works part-time for me, and she will help me with updating the market posts. Um, some of it is what we call evergreen content, which is uh, stuff you never have to really touch. It'll be useful next week and next month and next year. And one of those I use is Altos Research. And those do market charts with market information. They use list prices. So a lot of people want to know about sale prices. So I have other data for that. Um, so those are very powerful at attracting home buyers who are trying to understand the market. And if you drill it down to something more specific than the zip code, for example, in the city of Saratoga, there are three different high school districts and the real estate market is different in those three districts. It's also different between the top tier of pricing and the bottom tier of pricing. 
So uh, what I do is a months of inventory or absorption rate for the Saratoga market by price point and high school district. And people love that because they don't get it from Altos Research because it just does zip codes. It's good data, but it, it doesn't drill it down to that level. And other sites that I've seen do stuff by pure zip code level. So um, I find that very helpful to create unique content or using RPR, which is the Realtor property resource that's available to all realtors, I believe. Uh, it's certainly available to us for free. There's data I can extract from there and then put it together so that people can see that in certain areas, homes are appreciating faster than certain other areas. And that's information that buyers and sellers both care about. So um, sometimes I do articles on staging um, or explain what something is. For example, uh, we have disclosures that talk about what is a cripple wall. So they don't know what a cripple wall is. So I'll show them. So sorry, that was kind of a long answer, but it's all over the board between um, market conditions, um, interesting homes, historic homes, and, um, and neighborhood profiles. So the neighborhood profiles are very powerful for getting business. I'd encourage anybody to do that. No, I love it. I think that's a really great answer. Um, and I really love that you talk about targeting because I think targeting is really important. I mean, uh, when I talk about marketing for stagers, it's the same thing. I mean, you have to be very targeted and very specific about the type of people mm -hmm. you're attracting. And same thing with blogging. You have to blog for the right type of clients that you want to attract. Like you said, you hate a short sale, but you are number one you know, ranked on Google for short sale because of your blog. And that didn't really make a lot of sense to you because you actually hate short sale. Yes, I've done them, but I hate them. And so it's like only you, you write about what you love. And if you love going to a Shakespeare festival, by all means, write about it, go sponsor it. And other Shakespeare lovers will find you there. But if you don't like Shakespeare, don't do it. So uh, because you're not going to it's not going to make sense in the context of how you spend your time. I really believe that wherever you spend your time, whether it's online or if it's at social functions or volunteer work, all those places can bring you business. And sometimes they bring you business when you never even talk about business, but they find that you're a person of character or that you have shared values and, um, and that can bring you business. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And so how like how has blogging changed your business? Oh, I love it. Um, well, I like to write, so this is not a burden for me. So somebody who hates blogging or hates writing probably wouldn't um, wouldn't do that. But last year, um, I always go back and look at where did my business come from in the last calendar year. So most years now, it's between fifty and seventy or seventy five percent of my clients are from the blogs. And last year for 2017, 55% of my income was from people who met me through my blog and had a transaction with me for the first time. Another 15% were repeat clients who originally found me from the blog. So uh, blogs, I should say. So it's huge. It's a huge impact. And the thing about blogging that's so nice is it doesn't cost much money. It does cost time. But once you've written it, it's out there. If you haven't set up your structure badly with a date in the URL, like I tell people, don't put the date in the URL. Because if you do, you've just pinned it on the wall for time. But if you leave the date out and it just says like stagedforhomes.com forward slash awesome staging idea, you can go back every six months, change the article, freshen it up, and then publish it with a new date. And Google will recognize it as being older content that's been updated and it will have more weight because of its history. And blogging in real estate does the same thing. You can talk about disclosures and now a new disclosure has come out, new piece of paperwork, so you can update it and you're current, but Google will give it a lot of weight because it's it's been updated, not just left to sleep. I so, agree with um, that so much. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's it's wonderful. And it, if you like doing it, I mean, I think it's really smart for us to prospect or market ourselves in things that are sustainable and it's sustainable if we like doing them. So, 
you know, it's very easy for me to stay here and write all day, but that's not good because real estate, you have to be out there. You have to be looking at homes and meeting buyers, sellers. Um, but I do a lot less open houses than I used to. Um, I love to sell my listings and I'll do my open houses enthusiastically to sell my listings. I don't do them to pick up buyers. A lot of people don't do that. They do the opposite of what I do or they want to sell their listing, but they're also trying to pick up buyers. So my strategy is very different. Um, and it's great. I, I only do open houses for my own listings. And that's a big thing. I don't chase down expireds or for sale by owners. I just, they come to me sometimes, but I just, I love it because when my clients find me through the blogs, they already feel like they know me, like me and trust me. So it's a lot less selling involved. No, I agree with that. And so do you ever get writer's block? You know, I keep um, a three or four files, file folders, and I get ideas. And I'll like, from one of my real estate magazines or something, I'll rip out a page or take a photocopy and I'll throw it in the file, you know, write about this. Or I'll see an article and I'll write about that. Sometimes I tweet things that I think I'm going to look back later at my Twitter feed and see what I want to write about. So I actually don't have writer's block. I have sat down and created a list of neighborhoods I want to be able to dominate on page one of Google. And that alone can keep me really, really busy. So once I got a listing on the Strathmore neighborhood, and I sent you a screenshot from a, like a Google incognito, except it was on the Edge browser and it was an in private instead of incognito. But anyway, um, the first three results for the Strathmore neighborhood in Las Gatas are me. One's an act of rain, but the other two are my own personal blog sites. And at one time, I had all 10 of the page one results for that neighborhood on Google because I have a Google by maps and I had a Google plus and I had this and I had that. And of course I ignored it after a, a while. So it starts dropping off. But um, one of my plans is to get neighborhood domination by doing these neighborhoods one at a time. So I don't really get writer's block because I just keep a list. And there are a lot of things you could write about when you, whenever you get bored, go to your chamber of commerce's website, find an event and write about it. Just Find an event you like because, again, you want to be able to come back to it later and say, oh, I just went to the whatever festival and here are pictures of some of the cool food we ate. But you don't want to write about stuff that you just, I don't know, maybe other people say you should write about stuff you don't like anyway. But my thinking is write about what you like and then you'll have a consistency to you. I agree and you with won't that. get right no, I agree with that as well. I mean, because when you write about things you like, you I think you also naturally attract people you want to work with mm. because they share the same interests. And, you know, another idea, um, it's not my idea. It came from somebody else, I'm sure. But we as realtors and probably you as a staging professional get some of the same questions all the time, right? Like, do I have to yeah. move out of my house to sell it, to stage my house or you know, why do I have to do inspections? And so you could kind of go back through your email and say, what are the questions that my potential clients have that I hear all the time? What is title insurance? What is a plat map? And then you can go through your old emails and then take that as a starting point and rewrite it. Just leave the names out of it. And that's evergreen. That's evergreen content. Everybody wants to know the same questions. That's great. And so is this the only thing that you do for your online marketing uh, or no. do you do other stuff as well? No, I mean, you know, I've, I've got listings I have to market. Um, so that that's, gets a really big priority. So it's not just blogging to attract clients. So with um, obviously I believe in professional photography and um, the photographer I use uh, sometimes uses drone photography for me and does HDR. So they get really nice lighting so the rooms kind of I want them to look natural but not flat and so they're my photographer's got a camera that does things my camera can't do you would ex understand that better than I would but yeah. in terms of <laughs> other marketing yes I, I do some postcards um, especially for listings uh, broker open house public open house um, a little bit of newsprint not that much but I try to do both traditional marketing and regular marketing but the, the traditional marketing is more for my active sellers as opposed to attract sellers and buyers. I do a little bit, but not much of that. 
Okay, oh, and, got it. And marketing, I, I almost forgot to say, um, sphere of influence and past clients. I'm really good at that. I've got certain things on autopilot. Like I send a home by design magazine to my past clients. It goes every other month, whether I pay attention to it or not. And, um, you know, I send periodic gifts. Um, a Starbucks cards can be personalized. So I've got one that says, um, congratulations on your new home. It's a $20 Starbucks card or thanks for their business and referrals, a $10 Starbucks card. And I just sent out a bunch of pens with flashlights on them. And I want people to look and say, oh, good, there's mail from Mary. We want to open it, right? So it's not boring, boring, or just give me, give me your leads. It's what can I do for you? So that's huge. That's the other chunk of my business is from past clients and um, sphere of influence. That is great. I'm really glad you're talking about that because I think that is what makes you a really good marketer because you want to have a really mixed strategy. And I love that you do both online and offline and sending people physical mail. Yeah. I, um, and it's good to put some of it on autopilot because truthfully, we all get busy sometimes and then we neglect to pick up the phone or call or even text and, and do that kind of thing. So it, yeah. it is important. And a lot of the top coaches will talk about how you shouldn't just have your past clients as your only source of business. We know when it, when there's a declining market that those leads will dry up because nobody wants their friends to be unhappy and they will be unhappy in a, in a declining market, even if you do everything perfectly. You, you can't make them happy when the market's falling. So um, it's good to have multiple ways of um, finding new clients. So That's yeah, I'm great. all in favor of that. That's awesome. And what are some of the biggest misconceptions about blogging? Um, well, I think people are afraid that, that you have to do it like six hours a day or something like that. And it is true that it takes a commitment of time. But I remember asking Jay Thompson years ago when he was doing his blog, The Phoenix Real Estate Guy. I just picked up the phone. I said, Jay, how do you do this day in and day out? And he gave me a great practical answer. And that is, he said he would do it early in the day for an hour before his phone would start to ring. And I thought, well, that's a good discipline. I know people do that with exercise. I'm not actually that good that I do that with exercise. But if you do it in the morning before your phone starts blowing up, you can get an awful lot accomplished. And so I followed his advice for a long time. And now I just, I do it uh, at various times of the day because it's such an ingrained habit. I feel bad if a few days go by and I haven't blogged, but um, I think that's the biggest misconception. The other thing is that some people uh, think it's all writing all the time. There has to be huge, long things. And they don't. Google likes posts of about 300 words. Mine are often longer than that. But um, photos, especially using your keywords, can be super important. And a lot of people are very visual. Or they like to do YouTubes in their in their um blogging and that's powerful too so it doesn't have to be one kind of blog if you look around a lot of different things can be successful i love that and jay is a legend so for those audience members who don't know jay thompson he had a very successful blog the phoenix real estate guy that was very well known and he actually sold it he sold it to a group of yep. real estate agents Yep. And he moved on to work for Zillow and he recently retired. But Jay yeah. is an absolute legend in real He's estate. A treasure. He's just a great guy and so helpful to a lot of us who are just learning how to blog back in the day. Yeah. And I love that. I think you I think it's really amazing that both you and Jay turn out into a discipline. It's almost like a daily practice. Um, mm -hmm. and if you don't do it, you don't feel right. And then so I think that it's a really good advice. I think that's the thing. I think most people feel that in order to make great changes in their business, they have to do something really big. But actually, if you just have a really good, strong habit that's that you do it every day, even just 15 minutes a day, I think can really push your business very far. Yeah. And, you know, some people, just the word blog seems to be a turnoff to them. So just replace it in your head with the word website. And maybe before you even start blogging, you probably have some website that your company has provided you and maybe start writing content, add a page here, add a page there, do a little photo essay of your neighborhood or a neighborhood where you, you sell a lot of homes or want to sell a lot of homes. And then you find out it's not that scary. It doesn't have to be on WordPress where you start. 
True. And so what are some of the advice that you have when, uh, for someone who wants to start to blog? Well, there's a lot of good tutorials online. I mean, you could just go to YouTube or go to Google or whatever your favorite search engine is and, and type in how to become a real estate blogger. Um, there are courses available. There was one that Fran Fl Flynn Thorson used to have, and I think Joanne Foslin had called No Blogger Left Behind. Mm. And there are lots of free courses and articles about how to start. I think the main thing is to know who you want to talk to, who's your target audience. And I did once a CRS class, you know, certified residential specialist class on creating a business plan. And part of the exercise they had us do was to sit down and write out for a page or two who our ideal clients were and then figure out how are we going to get them? How are we going to meet them? How are we going to convert them? How are we going to serve them? And this is the same thing with your blog is you want to figure out who's that ideal client and what are they going to be looking for? In fact, if you go to Google and type in something like, you know, let's say your, your town is Las Vegas, you type in Las Vegas real estate or Las, get back, Las Vegas real estate market. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you will have similar questions. And all those similar questions could be possible blog posts. And just do that with neighborhoods, you know, Pinewood, uh, Pinewood neighborhood market update, and then see what else pops up as a question at the bottom of that Google page. And those are easy places to start and, and create a file, write a list of what would be the questions you'd have if you were moving to your neighborhood. So that's there's lots of places. Good advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's such good advice. I love it. And so how do you write to connect with your potential customers? I'm sorry, how do I what? How do you write to connect with your potential customers? Oh, okay. So I think the big thing is what are the questions they're going to ask? So a lot of people, especially under the age of 50, don't type in phrases. They type in questions on Google. And so just start writing down questions. Just start up piece of paper, type it out. I don't care. And what are the questions they were going to ask? Are they going to ask what are closing costs? What are closing costs for buyers? Who pays the commission? You know, um, how long is an escrow or do we have to have an attorney? We get East coast people who are used to attorneys who come out West and they're wondering why we don't have attorneys. So you can answer all those questions. Any questions you think you've been asked more than once or twice. Those are all good questions. Just write all your questions down. And before, before you know it, you've built a basis and then pepper it with real estate market posts. And um, most association of realtors have some market data, at least on the state level, that you can use at no cost. So you don't have to go broke providing this or spend hours on your MLS getting the stats. But buyers love statistics. So do sellers, especially they want to know how long is it going to take to sell my home? And then once it does sell, how long I'm, I'm, before I have to get out of the house. So hmm. um, if you write those questions, then when they go to Google, they will type in the question. And if your search engine optimization is done right, you've used your keywords enough times and all of that, then they will find you that way eventually. It may, may not happen on day one, but I would say within three or four months, you will you will see that you're getting really good results if you've done it just right. That's amazing. And so how do you, so do you, when you are writing, do you write for SEO or you're doing keyword yes. search or so how do you do it? So, well, the thing is Google's always changing what it's looking for, but if you're writing about, I'll say the Los Gatos real estate market, you pick a phrase like Los Gatos real estate market. That's kind of long, but I would use it three to five times in a post, in an article. I would make sure that I have a photograph and that for the alt tag, which describes what the picture is to those who can't see it, I put in the description, Los Gatos real estate market uh, chart for May 2012 or whatever it might be. And then some of the subheadings would have it. And maybe, you know, I just use it in the post, but you don't want to do it too much because then you get in trouble with Google. It's called keyword stuffing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great plugin for those on WordPress called Yoast, Y-O-A-S-T, and it will give you red, green, and yellow dots 
um, for if you're doing well or if you're not doing well on one thing or another. Um, I always get red dots for readability because I write with complex words and Yoast doesn't like it, but my engineer clients do. So <laughs> I'm okay great. with that. So, I love that. Yeah. So uh, Yoast is a great help for figuring out, you know, what to do. Although sometimes I think it's helpful to mix up the words and not look too, you're writing to people. So you don't want it to sound like you're just using keywords and, you know, you want your people to like it, but you also want Google to be able to see it. So, and then when you're done with your post, go out and promote it. You can use your Google Plus account if you have one, and that gets it indexed quicker, I believe. And you can share it on Facebook on your business page. You don't want to share it on your personal page unless it's like an event, because um, you don't want to get in trouble with Facebook. And then Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever else you're busy. If it's a photo post, you could go to Pinterest or Instagram. And all those things will help Google to find it and record it. That's great. And so what are some of the trends that you're seeing with technology and blogging in real estate right now? Just the plugins are getting so much better. You know, the the ability to add listings that are indexable, meaning that Google can see your listings um, if and in the URL for your page, let's say you're You've got a house for sale at 123 Main Street, San Jose, California. You'll see in the URL, it might say myname.com forward slash 123 Main Street. And that helps if your buyers are looking at 123 Main Street. Maybe they Google the address, then they might stumble onto you that way. And if you have lots of listings from the MLS on your website, you get a lot of pages. Another really, really powerful one that I love is the translation plugin Transposh. And what's really neat about Transposh, it's free, is that it will take whatever you write and translate it into a number of different languages. Now, it doesn't just do it when somebody goes to your page and says, I want to see it in Urdu. It produces them, it publishes them in Urdu, if you've asked for it to, right away. So you've got a 100-page blog or website, and now maybe it's a 2,500 page website because you've got 25 languages translated. So I'm making up the numbers. I don't really know how many languages it has, but I once sold a house to somebody who was in Hawaii looking for information on Silicon Valley real estate in French. And she found my machine translated page. It was a different plugin at the time. And she said, although it was bad French, it told me a lot that you cared enough to provide information to me in my language. And I got hired because of that. At least, you know, I got met because of that. And then they liked me and they hired me. That's very cool. I love that story. Yeah, well, it's good for humans and it's good for the search engines. Yeah, and I think the ultimate lesson here with blogging is that at the end of the day, you're still writing to humans because humans are reading them. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important that you are writing, but at the same time, you're keeping your keywords in mind. But not overstuff them, obviously. So right, yeah. And variety is really good. Like they don't want to just people don't want to look at a wall of words. And I have to work at that because I tend to be word heavy, and so I try to remember to put in pictures. And you could create graphics too. Sometimes people go, I don't know where to get pictures, but there are actually a lot of free resources out there that you can use. Sometimes you have to attribute, and sometimes you don't. But you can also go to a site like PicMonkey and create a graphic and maybe upload a picture of burlap that you have and then transpose words or put words on top of it and just create something visually interesting, even if it's a, a quote and it's not really like a picture of a mountains or a baby duck or something. So um, that's something I have to always remind myself because I'm, I lean heavy on the words. That's pretty true. Um, do you get penalized for having too many words? No. Um, you know, what's funny is I've had, I've taken a lot of classes in blogging and sometimes they'll say, don't write more than 400 words because Google doesn't care. And it's like, well, you know what, my engineers and my lawyers and my doctors, they like diving deep. And right. so it, I'm going against the conventional wisdom, but it seems to really work. Um, so it's just, you don't want to have so many words that people feel like they're looking at the white pages of the phone book. Mm -hmm. So um I try to mix it up and, you know, use bullet points and bold and italics and different things besides just graphics to um, 
to make it more palatable visually? Yeah, personally, I actually prefer long form because I think it's more informative.、Mm-hmm. Um, I think, like you said, as long as you're breaking up the content with you know paragraphs and bullet points and stuff like that, I think it's fine.、Mm-hmm. I, I think so. That's been my experience. Yeah. So my last one question for you is that, lastly, if someone can only follow one advice, what is the top one advice you have for someone who wants to start with their blog? Well, I think it would be the same advice I'd give somebody who is starting their business, and that is figure out your target market, and then aim everything at that. That so is so good. So, if you want to be the, the condo queen, write about condo developments. Every condo development in your town, start in one area, then branch out, and then learn everything about HOA docs and HOA fees and assessments and just whatever your target market is. And that would be true if you were. Doing a regular business plan, you know, you'd be holding open houses in the condos, and you'd be door knocking in the condos if you had to, sending postcards to the condos. So it's the same thing. Treat it like part of your business plan, or your business, and do a plan. That's great. I love it. Thank you so much for being on the show. I、really、appreciate it. Yay! Yeah, it's pretty painless, right? So that's it for the show. Thank you so much for listening. You want to help and support the show? There are three ways to do so. You can leave a review and rating on iTunes. You can share the show on social media, or you can donate to support the hosting costs for the website and the podcast. You can now make a donation through the show notes on the sidebar of our website. So thanks so much again for listening. Have a wonderful week and happy staging. And don't forget to check out our show sponsor. Our show is brought to you by the Saging Assistant. It's more than an inventory system. Manage your leads, your proposals, your clients, and your sage houses on your desktop, tablet, or phone. With the Saging Assistant, you will know what you own, where it is, and when it's returning quickly and easily. Create your design and packing list from the comfort of your home, so you can hit the ground running when you go into your warehouse. Created by Sagers, specifically for Sagers, is the only tool you need to manage your growing saging business. For more information, visit sagingassistant.com.